just like to invite um, Laurie. Laurie and Dennis to come and do Welcome to Country. They're our local custodians. Please welcome them. Uh, good evening, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to uh, the land of my ancestors. Uh, Dennis and I are two custodians of this land. We are of the, I suppose you'd say, the Gurringai language group. Um, and our language group goes right through to almost Newcastle. So that encompasses a lot of clans. And, it, um, and the, the clans that it encompasses are called the One and Guinea Nation. So it can get a bit complicated. You've got uh, uh, you've got a Wabikal up Newcastle, then you've got Garingai, Garigal, you've got Wakalawa, you've got Darug out west, but Darug has a lot of subclans in it as well. Even like places like Taramara. Taramara is the Taramedical people. There's a lot of city suburbs like that named out. Um, oh, you're kidding. <laughs> <laughs> My phone's been playing up, sorry. <laughs> yeah, anyway, so on behalf of my ancestors, I welcome into this country. Uh, I pay my respects to my ancestors for looking after it so well. Now, you have, once you have a situation, you've got uh, custodians, traditional owners of an area, and you've got land councils, which aren't traditional owners of an area. That's where the problem lies. They haven't got the same love of this land as we do. It's a money-making project to them quite often. So it's a different way of thinking. To us, it should stay bush forever. Yeah. So, <laughs> two different ways of thinking. So that's the way a custodian would always think on their own traditional land. Remember, we have 300 different Aboriginal countries in Australia. We all think differently. We all do things differently. But to them, it's a money-making project. To us, it's mother. Mother Earth. She is our lady. She, we got to look after her. I teach this at, at schools and preschools all the time. If you want to know more about our land and country, come and do one of my tours. Karingo tours. So it's a... You can't hear me. Move forward. <laughs> oh, if you want to hear me. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so let's see what we can do, eh? and moving forward. We're pushing something uphill, unfortunately, because I think the government wants it to happen. They want to put more people in, in Sydney. So, and I don't know if you noticed, but they're already building a new uh, bridge down there at the bottom. So we've got a fight on our hands. So I'll put Dennis on for a bit. You all right? Okay, unless it remains coming. <laughs> so, thanks everybody for coming. Um, we are very fortunate to have a wonderful panel tonight who have given their time to us. I am part of the Northern Beaches Bushland Guardians and I'd like the Guardians to stand up that are in the room. <laughs> Deb, Sarah, Pam, Kristen, <laughs> Connie. I'd like to thank everybody that um, signed our petition and we got it to Parliament New South Wales about two months ago, which um, MP Michael Regan presented to us along with Rory, Matt Cross and James Griffin. We really appreciate the community effort. We got 12,400, yep, and um, it was an epic, you know, thank you so much for stopping and talking to us to save this land. We've got a fight on our hands community. A lot of people when we're at the markets think the fight is over and it's all good and the land's gonna stay, but we have 225 hectares of bushland that is the size of 45 soccer fields that we need to save and we need to fight for because it will change Belrose, Narrabeen, Pitwater and French's Forest forever. And I'm so glad that you guys have come tonight and turned up because it takes a community to speak up. I'd like to welcome our panel to come up tonight. I'm gonna to welcome, if you can save the applause for when they've, they've seated. I will ask the panel when they're speaking if they could stand up so the audience at the back will probably hear more what you're saying. So it's a bit hard when you're at the back to see you. So it'd be great if you could just stand. And I really, really appreciate you coming tonight out of your busy lives. So I'd like to introduce our mayor, 
Sue Hines. <laughs> MP for Pitwater, Rory Amon. <laughs> MP for Wakehurst, Michael Regan. We've got a wonderful professor here, Professor Rico Meekhart is here tonight. And the amazing and one only counselor, Kristen Glanville. So I'm gonna start by asking you um, all to just introduce yourselves individually rather than me introduce them. And um, so if Sue, you can start. Just introduce yourself, why you're here, why you care about the bushland and um, who you are. Gee, I almost feel like I'm at an AA meeting. <laughs> My name is Sue Hines. Um, I'm the Mayor of the Northern Beaches Council. I'm very honoured to represent this community. Why am I here? Um, I've been on council for 11 years. This has been a long, hard journey um, over many, many years. And we, I feel now, are at the pointy end of all of this. And I do believe that this is just such a travesty that's about to happen. And this is our last chance to make your thoughts and feelings known. And personally, I just don't want to be um, here watching this happen. I think we have so much to protect. It's vital land and um, just really hope that we can make enough of a noise so that the Department of Planning actually hear what we want in our own area. So thank you. Thanks, Rachel. And um, thank you to all the Bushland Guardians for all your hard work and efforts in putting this together and, and organising this event. And, and thank you all to you for coming as well. I'm Rory Amon and I'm the member for Pitwater. Pitwater covers from um, postcodes 2101 up to 2108 and also 2084. So that's basically all of um, from Narrabend to Palm Beach and then including Terry Hills and Duffy's Forest. And one of the reasons, and, and like Sue, I've been on council but no longer anymore, uh, one of the reasons why I'm so um, passionate about stopping this proposal is I grew up in the, the forest area. I grew up in Davidson, I grew up in Belrose, I grew up in French's Forest. And so I've known this area all my life. And I've never known Morgan Road as Morgan Road. I've only ever known it as Lizard Rock Road. And, and this development will um, inherently change the character of our area. But what it will also do is, is in my capacity as a volunteer firefighter, and, and I saw the... the the significant risk that is created when you put houses um, in such a fire prone area. And we saw it on the south coast where you have effective uh, low density residential backing onto what is effectively a national park. And what we're seeing and what we would see if Lizard Rock development goes ahead um, is significant risk, um, the likes of which we have never seen in this area. And there is no infrastructure to get people in and out and there won't be any infrastructure to get people in and out. So, um, that combined with preserving the, the ecological sensitivities of the area is really important to me, and so that's why I'm here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you, Bushland Guardians, for putting this on. It's a big deal, and thank you all for hearing the call and, and coming here and rallying with us to do this. Uh, quite simply, since 2008 when I was the mayor and uh, we fought and started that fight back then, uh, Connie Harris and I, um, when we were on council together, did a lot on this subject and we thought we worked with the then Minister for Planning Rob Stokes uh, at a particular point where we thought we'd got it to declaring it an Aboriginal National Park uh, and unfortunately the Land Council had different ideas, it changed its mind, changed its leadership and now we're going down the path and the previous government put us in the position we're in by moving it forward. Uh, so that's why I'm here is to stop that from happening like you're all here to stop that from happening. Uh, we do not do these developments anymore. We do not take our pristine bushland full stop. We do infill development. We work with the, we, um, we work with our council, we work with our community, we look at where we're gonna put our housing for the future and we do that around the infrastructure. And that's what I've always worked on, those basic planning principles. We do not do land clearing anymore and put houses, not here and not ever, and we shouldn't be doing that. So uh, we need to stop it and this is our last um, throw of the dice. Now, 
I also would like to thank the uh, Bushland Guardians for organizing this and for having me. Uh, my name is uh, Ricky Merkel, I'm a local resident and also a professor in transport and supply chain management. So perhaps a little bit of a sort of, a, not outsider, but a you know, not typical politician. But I'm The smart <laughs> one. Uh, but I'm sort of as in my role as a professor in transport and supply chain management at the University of Sydney. I'm involved in leading very large international projects that help try and help industry to decarbonize their supply chains in particular. And so we spend a huge amount of money, like millions of dollars, uh, to help those companies to reduce the carbon footprint by, say, a percent or so, right? Because climate change is real, it's really urgent that we do uh, have action there. Um, and so we have lots and lots of projects that try and help to stop climate change from happening and to help decarbonize industry. And to then come home and to see you know, this, that this proposal is essentially bulldozing a very large area of native bushland, uh, which is essentially you know, carbon sink trees, right? So they help to decarbonize, is, uh, is especially when, when we know that council provides alternatives for, for housing, um, is, uh, is, is just very hard to comprehend. Um, and so we have written a, a little article um, on the wider um, sort of uh, environmental impacts of this proposal that is available on our website, and I will talk a little bit more about this uh, tonight, and uh, I'm really happy that I'm able to be here. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi, I'm Kristen Glanville. I'm one of the councillors on Northern Beaches Council, and I promise this isn't just a politician whitewash. Um, I promise I have at least some useful skills because I'm an environment and planning lawyer, so my day job is looking at development applications, reading planning proposals, and um, taking pot shots at things. So it's a skill set that will hopefully equip us to define the problems with this proposal. And um, there's, there's many, um, and we will be talking about them throughout the evening. But, you know, what I come down to is once you clear bushland like this, it's gone forever. You can't get it back. And one of the other bushland guardians said to me, Kristen, why are you, you doing this? Like, you know, you've got a full -time job, two full-time jobs almost and a baby. Why are you doing this? And it's, you know, speaking for those who can't speak, you know, the wildlife that lives at Lizard Rock, the future generations. Um, my son can't talk yet, but perhaps when he's big enough to, and in future generations, they will say, you know, why didn't you save places like Lizard Rock from development? Because, you know, once you clear that habitat, you lose those species, they lose that area where they can have a viable breeding population, you know, you can't just sit back and let that happen. So um, we've got a fight on our hands. Our planning system is designed to approve things I did some back of the envelope calculations about how many planning proposals get up and to, to full disclosure, I don't like our odds if you go off the percentage of planning proposals for rezoning applications that get up, most of them do. So um, now is a time to not sit on your hands if this is something that you feel really passionately about. Um, we've got one kind of last final shot to stop the rezoning happening before it's it's too late and then once it's if it's approved you then start the process of then there's da applications and anyone who's objected to a da knows that when you get to that stage it's damn near impossible so um we need to fight on and i look forward to fighting with all of you to um, save this bushland for the animals and future generations Thank you guys. Um, also, I'd like to acknowledge um, Nicole Roman and Christine Cooley, um, Save the Bushlands and Oxford Falls Group as well. I know we've got Manly Dam Group here in Pitwater. There's many other organisations, not just ours, that are working together for our community. We are a non-partisan group and it's great to have Sue here and Janine here 
who ran in the last election, and we welcome everybody to work together and solve this issue. And I'll just say one more time, guys, there's a whole front row now, so please come down. Nicole, Sue, please come down to the front row. It's all empty and grab a seat. Thanks. <laughs> and we'll lead the way. <laughs> all right, I'm going to start with Sue. Sue, what does it mean to protect this land? You've got two minutes to answer each question, guys, and Pam is our timer. Okay. Um, to protect this land, I, I think this has now become a very personal thing. As I've learnt more and more across the northern beaches and watching the environment, and certainly for some of you in this room that I know hold the environment close and dear to your heart, the reality of it is we all live here for the environment. The reason we've chosen here is because this place is unique, it's beautiful, you have such a range of incredible, natural, um, beautiful parts of the environment that everybody loves, whether it's the beach, the waterways, whether it's the um, wildlife, whether it's the birds, um, whether it's the unique trees that we have and the um, ecosystems that live beneath and underneath them. And due to council, um, I've actually had to learn quite a few things along the way and all it does is make you appreciate even more deeply how unique this place actually is. To know that this is going to be demolished, um, I just find very difficult to comprehend and absolutely mind-blowingly bad in every single sense of the word. It's personal. This is becoming very, very personal. I also have found in the past um, that I just find the whole thing quite ironic that at one moment we're told the land is so incredibly um, uh, sacred <laughs> that we can't have bike riders bicycling through it and that the next moment it's okay for development. That to me just doesn't make any sense. And I find that extremely personal as well. Thank you. Rory, do you think Lizard Rock means in terms of precedent for all other sites on the Northern Beaches? Is Ralston Avenue the next cab off the rank? Uh, yes, it would be. And not only that, but you have the Belrose TAFE site, which is just across the road. You've got Ralston Avenue. You've got all sorts of other Crown Land parcels throughout the, the northern beaches that this would set a precedent for. So if you say it's okay to level the Lizard Rock site, then why wouldn't it be okay to level all those other sites? So you're right, it's not just about Lizard Rock, um, albeit that's the battle before us now, but it's about so much more in terms of all the matters um, Sue referred to, no doubt Michael and, and Rico and um, Christian will refer to. So, yes, this will set a precedent, which is why we, we need to do everything we can to stop it, which no doubt, as the evening progresses, we'll talk about things we can do to help prevent it. Thank you. I'm going to love time. I'm going to love timing with the bell, because if you've ever been to council, right, they count you down, so <laughs> game on. <laughs> I've got my bell ringers. Michael, Lizard Rock is situated in your electorate. What do you think the community has had such a strong negative reaction to... Why do you think this, the community has had such a strong negative reaction to this proposal? I think Sue sums it up the best when she says it's personal. And for those of us who live here and have grown up here um, or visited here, etc., and Rory spoke as well about growing up here, it is personal. Uh, we live here, uh, we work hard to live here and uh, it's, it's, it's our playground. It's, it's the nature, it's the bush, it's the beach, it's why we um, this is the lifestyle. And as I said, for, uh, we all know that we, we all, I've got a lot of hammerings in my 15 years as a, um, as a mayor and on council when we've talked housing plans and we've said we're going to do it this way and here and there because it's, this, is, uh, this is a better way of doing it and it's around infrastructure and the like. Uh, this is not. And, it's, and those who've talked to me personally have even mentioned and, and already touched on it is the, uh, the 94 fires, you know, that was where the ring of fire around Sydney and uh, people still have vivid memories of standing on Morgan Road watching that fire come over. And that 
is uh, an absolute what scares a lot of people and who can have got long memories and those who are still working um, and volunteering in the rural fire service know how bad it is and those ember attacks would be. So there is no escaping Morgan Roads, only it's a small two lane road and even with additional lanes and things like that, it would still be, because 400 homes will not be 400 homes after complying development and other state government things come in. It becomes 600 homes, it becomes 700 homes, it becomes granny flats and etc. etc. And you try and get all that then out on when there's a fire, uh, there's what, another five, 600 cars plus on the road, it ain't gonna work. Thank you. Professor, we know approximately 50 hectares of bushland will be clear. What does science say about the current play of biodiversity and climate change, and what is the wider impact of the land clearance on the environment? So being a professor, we rely on sort of evidence-based research, and we rely on a lot of stats. So I prepared a few stats that I would like to share with you, just uh, three, so because I only have two minutes. Uh, um, but biodiversity is, is really, really important here, and we do understand this when we actually walk through this area. There are wallabies, there are all sorts of animals, including black cockatoos. And we had a recently a really successful event, event where we showed uh, where we showed um, that's better. Okay. So I said biodiversity is really important here. So there's a lot of uh, you know endangered uh, animals uh, in this area, and um, including the black cockatoos. Uh, we had recently a really successful event where we showed this uh, film about the, the crisis of the black cockatoos, and uh, obviously that affects us as well. And it affects Australia uh, more generally because Australia holds the record for the highest number of mammal extinctions globally, so we're number one in that regard. Uh, with to date uh, 55 wildlife species and 37 plant species, have gone extinct in Australia. So this proposal will obviously add to this uh, trend, uh, which is not a great one. But beyond that, and perhaps more importantly, uh, some colleagues of mine, uh, as a team that is based in Germany, uh, Denmark, and Sweden, they have recently published a paper in which they have frighteningly shown that Earth is beyond six of nine planetary boundaries, suggesting that Earth is now well outside of the safe operating space for humanity in terms of climate change in particular. So what that should suggest is that it's not just the black cockatoos or endangered animals, it's actually us. So it's too dangerous for us if we continue like what we are doing today. And um, um, another statistic that, that adds to this is that Australia is, uh, Australians are the highest um, carbon emitters per person. So globally, so something that is uh, that's something that I didn't know is that the Australians emit per person more than the average U.S. American. Again, another not so great record. And another stat that is relevant here is that Australia is facing a deforestation crisis, with an area equivalent to the MCG being destroyed every 86 seconds. Right. So it's quite a massive trend, and this proposal would definitely add to this. And that's why we need to work together to stop this. Thank you. Kristen's not only a counsellor, she's also a lawyer, so I'm going to ask her this. And, and thank you to all those that submitted questions as well, we really appreciate it. The planning proposal proposes a dwelling cap of 450 dwellings, R2 residential zoning and DCP planning controls to limit development and retain about 20 hectares of bushland and trees. As a planning lawyer, how enforceable is this though? Yeah, look, my personal and professional view is what we've been put forward is something that has been put a very shiny bow around it. There's a lot of very pretty controls in the draft DCP. There's a lot of, um, Things that are said in the planning proposal around, for example, um, having restrictions on title to stop further development taking place. The difficulty is that the way that they're proposing to protect the bushland and limit development is really weak. So for a start, if you want to have an area where your primary goal is to conserve its ecological character, then the best way to do that is to apply a conservation zoning. So they're making it either a C3 or C4 zone. The benefit of that is that it removes the option 
for landowners to have a CDC, which means that they can't do development via private certifier. They have to get a DA. Um, and so by proposing to make it R2, what they're essentially saying is that down the track, future landowners can keep that door open to continue doing more development on their land via CDC. The other issue with the way that they've proposed to put restrictions on title is that planning law doesn't recognise that as a barrier to approving more development on the site. It's standard in an LEP that if there's a restriction on title, a consent authority, so a future council or the Land and Environment Court, can approve something anyway, notwithstanding that restriction on title. And really what the way that they've proposed pushes all of the impetus onto council to then have to police what's in a restriction on title. They put the impetus on council to have to police, you know, if certifiers are doing the right thing in the area. So I agree with Michael Regan's comment that really when they say 450 houses, I don't think that's a realistic number with what we're going to end up with. And that is as much acknowledged in the planning proposal itself, where it talks about granny flats as being part of the housing diversity that would be created at this site. So I think that it's very well acknowledged that we would have more than 450 houses. As for the DCP controls, they are very easily overridden. They're basically a starting point. But, you know, if someone is going via CDC, it doesn't matter what is in the DCP control, really. They can do whatever they like in terms of building a granny flat or building to the CDC codes, which don't respect things like ecological values. So, look, if you were serious about doing a development there that protected conservation, you know, they would be asking for a conservation zoning. They would be asking for a heritage conservation area to be applied that um, gave, you know, legislated protection to the heritage items there and the environmental heritage. That's not what's being asked for. What they're asking for is basically the most lucrative type and weakest type of zoning with a bit of good marketing built around it. Um, so it just doesn't meet the goals of what I think the community expects in terms of being really serious about conserving our existing natural environment. Thank you. Back to Sue. Question two. What action has council taken so far regarding Lizard Rock? I'm trying to do this in two minutes, right? Take your time. But what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you a, an overview of the different types of things council has been doing and only just from recently. So the Northern Beaches Aboriginal Land Development Delivery Plan was approved by the then Minister of Planning, Anthony Roberts, in August 2022. Council formally opposed the making of that plan. Then in November 2022, Council resolved to oppose the draft planning proposal to rezone the land which had been submitted to the Strategic Planning Panel of Sydney North Planning Panel for review and made strong submissions to the panel. In January 2023, Council resolved to decline to be the Planning Proposal Authority for the planning proposal and to write to the New South Wales Premier, the Opposition Leader and others, reiterating its strong opposition to this proposal. It also sought legal advice on this matter. In June 2023, the Department of Planning and Environment issued a gateway determination for the planning proposal with conditions including that it should proceed to public exhibition. In August 2023, Council wrote to the relevant government um, agencies, for example, the Rural Fire Brigades, etc., outlining its opposition to the proposal and requesting meetings to discuss its submissions. The planning exhibition of the planning proposal commenced in late September 2023 and submissions closed in November 2023. A report is being prepared for the 24th of October Council meeting coming up. A submission is being prepared by Council staff to the public exhibition by the Department of Planning. The CEO and the Council staff met with high-level represent 
representatives of the rural fire services. Separate advice has been sought from a bushfire planning consultant, Mer Meridian Urban, to form part of council's submission. The Department of Planning will review submissions, seek an independent review by a planning consultant, and then prepare a report with recommendations to the Sydney North Planning Panel. Should the panel support the planning proposal, the minister or his delegate will detem determine whether to make LEP changes. And just very quickly, some zoning history on Lizard Rock. Lizard Rock is in the deferred lands and area that remains subject to planning controls under the Warringah LEP 2000. In 2011, when Warringah LEP 2011 was made, replacing an old LEP for the most of the Warringah LGA, the then Minister for Planning, Brad Hazard, refused to include this land in the new LEP, ostensibly because of community concern. In 2015, Council again sought to bring the land into the Ringer LEP 2011 after having undertaken a significant study and much consultation, including the Department of Planning. Council eventually withdrew the planning proposal after the Department of Planning required additional costly studies to be done at a very late stage in the rezoning process. Even if the land had been rezoned by Council, at some previous point, nothing in law would have prevented the submission of the current planning proposal to rezone this land. I'd just like to say as someone, um, and I know um, Michael Regan has been through this as well, for someone who has been through this over and over again, it, it is just so frustrating. Doesn't matter which way we've turned, doesn't matter how many times we've said no, um, it still just keeps progressing. And why? We can only speculate, but it is just so frustrating. We are trying our hardest now. We need every single one of you to say something. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Rory, what does it mean for Davidson and Pitwater in particular? Thanks, Rachel. Can I, um, and I must apologise on behalf of uh, Matt Cross, who's the member for Davidson, who can't be here. His wife's undergone some surgery today, so he's taking care of her. But can I get an indication of, um, in terms of where we all live in this room and, and how many people live in the Davidson electorate? And how many live in Wakehurst? And Pitwater? So it looks like it's about, um, Davidson and, and Pittwater um, are kind of similar, and I think Wakehurst has a few more. So, look, what, what this um, does for um, Davidson and Pittwater is, in the Davidson area, it significantly um, increases risk of bushfire in terms of the, the risk it will pose if you put um, potentially 1,500 residents in this area. That's a lot of cars trying to get out if there's a bushfire. And what that means is it means um, that everyone else in the surrounding areas who might be trying to get out of that area is put at risk. What it means for the Pitwater area is you'll have significant more runoff through that catchment, which will go down into floodplains down in North Narrabeen and, and associated with Warrawood and, and related areas. Because when you, have hard, when you have hard surfaces, you have runoff and more of it. And so that will increase risk uh, of flooding uh, down in the pit water area in those catchments and will increase risk of fire uh, as well for the residents in that direct surrounds. But more broadly, it's the environmental impact of uh, removing um, significant um, uh, ecologically sensitive land and biodiversity, be it um, flora or fauna from that area. Um, that is a risk that we simply cannot undo. It, it is a, once it's gone, it's gone and we've lost it. There are, there are plants and there's vegetation which has been there for hundreds if not thousands of years. And once you get rid of it, you don't get it back. And so that is the, the significant over, uh, overriding concern that, that we have. And that affects um, everyone in um, Pitwater, Davidson and the Wakers areas. Michael. Does the proposal address affordable housing needs on the northern beaches? Do you want to take this one, Kristen? You have a, you have a very strong view on this. No, it doesn't. <laughs> well, uh, now I've been given open session from Michael. Um, no, 
I mean, look, it's going to be, there's going to be a small percentage that will be held back as affordable housing, but it's very unclear what the model for that would be. Normally where council was rezoning, something you would expect 10 or even in, with French's Forest, 15% to be held back as affordable housing. And we would require that to be in perpetuity and it would um, be managed by um, a social housing or a community housing provider. We don't have that much detail from the proponent about how they're going to do affordable housing. It seems at the moment that the proponent will just keep some of the housing as affordable housing for 15 years, which does it, it, it helps one generation, but to really have good affordable and social housing, you actually have to have a multi-generational approach to lifting people out of socioeconomic distress. The other thing is that I think there's a lot of um, half-truths contained in the planning proposal in terms of um, they say things like this will promote housing diversity and supply, um, but it's not really creating the supply of the type of housing that we're short on on the northern beaches. We're short on housing for downsizers. We're short on housing that's affordable for first-time buyers. We're short on housing that's affordable for key workers like teachers and police officers. The sorts of housing that it will enter the market at Lizard Rock, if you look at the median house prices in Belrose, the cheapest lots, which are their 200 square metre lots, if you compare that to a brand new apartment in DY, you're going to enter the market at least at 1.8 million, but I think probably two plus. The houses on the 450 and 600 metre square lots would enter the market at 2.5 to 3 plus. So I think that there has to be, we have to unpick the idea that all supply helps housing affordability. Supply contributes, but where this proposal doesn't create supply of the type of housing that we need. We need, as Michael said, housing in places where people can walk to school and walk to the bus stop. You'd have to be a bloody goat to walk to school from Lizard Rock, right? <laughs> the topology is like this, which creates another kind of problem because when you have a site that's like this, to create workable roads and footpaths, you have to do a lot of excavation to smooth it out and make the grade actually drivable, which then means that you can retain less vegetation and also you're just totally changing the topology and the hydrodynamics of an area, but we're getting off housing affordability. I guess it's just important to kind of apply a critical lens to claims made about, you know, people say this is just sort of NIMBYs who don't want to help housing supply. I'm a planning lawyer, my business is buildings being built, right? But this is not a good place to put them where you're putting in bushfire areas that first home, you know, growing families can't actually afford. So it's not the sort of supply that we would actually need in our area to contribute to the problem of housing affordability. And there's a classic example that women have the answers. <laughs> she knew the right answer. I just have more reasons. <laughs> Professor, why does this proposal have the potential to have a much bigger impact on the environment than bulldozing in its first stage more than 45 football fields? And obviously that, that figure with the 50, what was it, 55 football fields? 45. 45. I think it's a lot more than that. Um, and, um, and we have to remind ourselves that whilst the, this first stage of the proposal is really devastating for biodiversity, for climate change, it, 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 the proposal is much wider than that. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about six sites, and so in, so in total it's 227 yeah, yeah. Um, hectares, uh, which is a massive area, right? So that's, uh, you know, can't even imagine how large it is, so, but it's many, many more football fields. And so the research that we have done has shown that just for the small part of Blizzard Rock, you know, the entire community of Belarus would have to give up their cars for more than a year, and then you guys wouldn't be able to be for be able to be able to eat beef for, for many years just to offset that impact. Um, but then again, I think the important thing here is that this will send a signal uh, to um, other communities, and this will be seen as a precedent. 
And if you look at what's currently happening in Carillon um, and that development up there, it's at the Central Coast, uh, I think that sort of indicates what impact this could have. Because um, that is currently um, uh, also in discussion. It's very similar. There are black cockatoos there, there's you know, biodiversity, there's also sacred sites. And what's happening there is, there is that the Dark Union uh, Local Aboriginal Land Council, which is also governed by the New South Wales Aboriginal Land Council, um, they're trying to develop the land over there as well. And uh, so I feel that you know, if this goes ahead, the first stage, um, we will have more development on the other six sites. We will have more development up and down the coast. And again, that will have dev devastating impact on both di diversity, uh, but then also on, on, on climate change and, and deforestation. And so this is, I think, where it's really, really important to stop this, um, again, because it has so much wider impacts than, than what we currently see. Thank you. Kristen, what are some of the alternatives to this proposal? The MLALC has ambitious plans for money. Isn't it unfair that they can't develop and land uh, the land and make money? Yeah, this is, uh, I guess, from first principles, when thinking about whether to approve a development, um, the landowner, you can put to one side and think about, does the merits of this particular project stack up? And to me, they don't because of the biodiversity issues, because of the bushfire risk issues, because of the fact that it would be very difficult to service this area with public transport because the population density wouldn't be big enough, high enough to bring out more bus routes. It would be very difficult to traverse by walking or bike riding. And that's the sort of direction that modern town planning principles say are how you design where you put population growth. But to return to your question, I mean, we as the, I've been very active at, at volunteering with the Northern Beaches Bushland Guardians and we've taken the, we've always taken the view that, you know, we want to see a good outcome for Metro, but it has to be a win-win for everyone. It has to be an outcome that serves their economic needs, but also we have to include the community's needs and the needs of the environment that we exist in. Um, the previous leadership of Malauk had a really good proposal for an Aboriginal-owned national park, and we would love to see an, a return to that idea. Um, the Bushland Guardians have also considered other ideas. Um, you could, for example, do a land swap. We've identified a number of sites on the northern beaches in northern Sydney that have low, no biodiversity at all. They're in a much better location from a planning perspective in that they're very close to public transport. They're very close to services like stormwater and electricity. We've come up with a, a, a giant list of better places to put development. We could swap the land with Metro and say, you know, you can develop this site in exchange. We will take Lizard Rock and, and some of the other sites and make them expand the National Park Estate. Um, Lizard Rock connects very well into the wildlife corridor that connects um, Karingai National Park, Garigal National Park, um, and then down into the Narrabeen Lagoon, uh, Narrabeen Lagoon State Park. If you could connect all of these areas through a protected wildlife corridor, that would be such a fantastic outcome for the community and the environment. And I, so I guess what I'm saying is that I think that there are win-wins, but at the moment, unfortunately, the previous um, government and unfortunately our current government remain with a bit of a blinkered on approach that now this idea is in their head and it's in the system, they have to keep progressing it. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, we have to remind the government that, that you know, there's just, sorry, the microphone's cutting out. There's not just one way to serve the economic needs of someone. You don't have to create economic value just by exploiting nature and clearing trees. There are other ways that you can do that. We have to be smarter with the land that we've already, unfortunately, environmentally degraded. Um, so we see that there's potential for a win-win. We don't have ill will against Malak. We just think that this proposal isn't a good one and we want to have a refresh and to go back to the drawing board about what a just solution looks like for everyone, including for nature. Thank you. Sue, 
back to you. What is Council's position on the DDP? I don't really, I don't really know anymore, and I'm just being very honest now, what to say, because we just, we just want to protect what has always been told to all of us, that this is incredibly precious, and suddenly it's not. And I just can't think of a thousand ways of which we can say this anymore. So, Council, uh, I mean, I read the entire list. Council, and that's only just started from the end of last year, we can go back further and further and further on this. It, we've, we've tried every ice, every tr tried every single different way um, that we can think of because we're now down to only legal arguments. We've discussed this at council, at the briefings. Um, we can't try any emotional ways our only avenue now is by legal faults that we can find. So that's where we've spent quite a bit of money pouring through every single thing that we can. And I don't know how much to say that we are absolutely united. Every single elected councillor, past councillor, past councillors, past mayors, we've always been united. Oh, except one. Well, sorry, I don't. We'll just ignore that person. <laughs> 14 out of 15, absolutely in lockstep together. So, I mean, that's the reason why this is happening. This is the what reason why everyone is coming out and we just keep saying no. I don't know what else I can really say. So, thank you. Firefighter, you are very familiar with bushfire risks on the northern beaches. How does the proposal plan? How, sorry, how does the proposal plan to deal with this risk, and how is the plan adequate? Well, it's not adequate, and I think one of the council commissioned a, a, an expert to actually review the fire study done by the the developer, and, and what I'll say is that. The way in which um, the, the developer and even the department are now um, supporting this proposal is unlike anything I've ever seen. On the Department of Planning website, they provide a link to the proponent's propaganda website promoting their own development. On no development ever on any government website have I ever seen links provided to the material of the developer promoting their own development proposal. I mean, it's absolutely absurd. And and when you look at the when you look at the council fire report, it says um, the risk is significant. The risk cannot be mitigated. Um, the developer's own report relies upon the safety being dependent upon a new slip road, um, which would be built onto Forest Way and in and around the area. Um, now I can tell you this: there's going to be absolutely no money from the developer to build that there's going to be no adequate developer contributions to ensure that that um, infrastructure can be put in place. And we saw that when Council was given the Ingleside development. And when we looked at it, we went through the numbers, we said we will be um, hundreds of millions of dollars out of pocket in terms of putting the infrastructure in place to actually support the houses which are foreshadowed by that development. It'll be no different down there. And so the developer saying it'll be safe based upon certain infrastructure being in place, it's a furphy, the infrastructure won't be in place. And I, I will just say that the comment was made about the um, bridge down there being upgraded. Um, and I can now repeat this because I'm not on council anymore, so I'm, I'm not bound by any of those rules. But um, when we were in our, our briefings and we discussed it, and it, it wasn't a confidential briefing, um, council has actually said, if we approve the works to widen and replace this bridge, everyone will say it's to facilitate this rock. Well, it actually was because the bridge was going to fall down, and so it was actually a significant risk. Fire trucks wouldn't be able to go over it without a risk of it collapsing. Same with other emergency service vehicles, same with trucks and so on and things like that. So that bridge had to be replaced. So that, that, that's not why that's being done. But um, short answer is it's inadequate. The, the risk is significant. Um, as I indicated, um, I watched 
um, houses, uh, house after house burned to the ground in the south coast in the most extreme fire conditions we've ever seen. Um, and we're now heading into that here. Those communities are yet to recover from those tragedies and they're gonna be hit with them again. And so that is a real risk we face up here. Yes, we're by the beach. Yes, we live in the most beautiful part of Sydney, but we're not immune to the vicissitudes of nature and the fury of nature. And we will face it and the fires will come and the disasters will happen and they'll be just as bad here as they are everywhere else. And there's no reason why we will get special treatment or why we will bounce back quicker than other parts of the state and the country who are still doing it tough. So uh, it's, uh, to answer your question, it's inadequate. Rory, um, just, just on that, as a firefighter, how do you feel, like, as a firefighter from Davidson Royal Fire Brigade um, Service, rural, um, how do you feel going into that situation, being put in danger and that risk? How would it feel for you knowing that this could potentially put your team at risk? Um, well, look, we're going to be put at risk somewhere. It doesn't matter whether it's yeah. here or somewhere else. So that, that's going to happen, um, which it is what it is. But what, what people don't always appreciate is you read on the news that um, firefighter X um, died or had a heart attack on a tractor or whatever tragedy it is. But it, it's not just... The volunteers it's um it's their their fellow crew who witnessed it who were traumatized it's the families um of the the people who were injured and deceased who suffer it's the families of those who were traumatized who suffer um it's the the family it's the people who die in the fires it's their families it's the kids who now no longer have parents to to support them th through the, the rest of their lives and their education and whatever it might be so it, it's the broader community that is scarred and traumatized so um, volunteer firefighters will go into fires wherever they are and there will always be a fire somewhere. Um, of course, no one wants their own backyard to go up, but as, as a firefighter, we, we know what we sign up for. So um, it's going to be somewhere, but I think we need to be mindful that it's not just the firefighters who are put at risk. It, it is so much bigger than that. It's so much broad, broader than that and so much more than that. And so... That's something we really need to bear in mind as these things go through the planning process and communities think about them. Thank you. Thank you. You forgot to say it's preventable. All that risk is preventable. I thought he read my mind. I hadn't answered the question. <laughs> I've, al I've already signed a submission a few months ago. Why, Michael, do I need to sign another one? Could you explain to people in the room about submissions? Because I love annoying the Premier and the planning <laughs> um, Your submissions count. I just did a quick thing this afternoon. Most of you would know that I, I the number one reason I stood for for the uh, state MP role was because of Lizard Rock. And there's no, I made that no secret. I mentioned it in my first speech in Parliament. It was the very first private member statement I made. Uh, I've made two now on, the, on this subject and I've also done a notice of motion to it and I've also um, was very proud and very honoured to be asked to sponsor uh, the petition on behalf of the Bushland Guardians. So I was able to move that and have Rory and Matt and James all speak on it as well as others. Um, I'm very fortunate that I, I speak with the Premier probably every week. I meet with him probably every fortnight or every three weeks. I met with the planning minister on, on various things and I've met with him personally on this issue very early on. I met uh, more recently with the emergency services minister, Jihad Dib, on this particular issue and what Rory spoke about with the fire, the rural fire service and the issues there. Um, whenever I meet with any minister now, they also, we're not here to talk about Lizard Rock, are we, Michael? So it's making an impression. They know that it's, uh, it is the number one issue on the, on the beaches. They know that how, our feelings on it but I, I guess, I think it was Kristen who said it's going through a process. I, I think the government kind of wants it to be knocked out independently so they don't have to make the decision. I, I want to make sure that if they do have to make the decision because it's not knocked out independently, which I'm hoping it will be, and I think we all want it to be knocked out independently, then they've got enough support from the local community to say that, you know, that we're not doing this. So every submission counts. Uh, I sent out uh, into my electorate uh, the reply paid envelope. So to all of you who've uh, received that and sent back, thank you. Um, keep going. Tell your friends and, and get everyone else to do that and sign it. 
Uh, they are taking notice, the Department of Planning are taking notice, uh, but more importantly, every conversation I have with the Premier, every single conversation with the Planning Minister and with Jihad, they all get told how many submissions, how upset we are, and why this is not a good thing, and that we can do better, and we should do better. Now, the, the language from the Premier, at least, is, and from the Planning Minister, and I think Rory would agree, is that they're talking about infill development, they're talking about where infrastructure is, train stations, metro stations, we don't have that. We're lucky also that this falls out of the, uh, the housing targets. This is over and above any housing targets that have been set for the Northern Beaches. So there's lots of reasons for them, but we need to give them that one fine reason, not in the public interest, and significant community opposition. So it makes it hard for them to ignore. Because we're not being ignored, but we just want to make sure if it's not knocked out, knocked out independently, they've got enough strength in numbers, and your submissions, every single one counts. Michael, one more question. Could you explain, though, why a second submission? Because some people have already done a first oh, okay. one. The Thank second you. submission? Why a second submission? It's because uh, it, I think, and again, Kristen might have explained this, it starts again. The process has started again. It's gone to the next stage. So it's like a brand new process and they just ignore everything that was before. It's really simple. Thank you. Welcome to New South Wales planning system. <laughs> Professor, they said that there were 450 dwelling cap, but we think that it's more likely to be 600 plus dwellings. The, the topology also doesn't seem to work with the site for the roads or for active transport. How realistic do you think the proposed transport plan is? And what is your view on the impacts of, on traffic that is this proposal, the proposal will have? So again, I'm here wearing two hats, one as a local resident and then the other one as a professor on transport and supply chain management. And in my first role, I'm, you know, like you, I'm a resident. And uh, who in the room thinks that the current transport infrastructure is adequate? <laughs> no one, right? Uh, anyone you know, standing in that traffic you know, in the morning trying on Morgan Road trying to turn right to get onto White Wakehurst Parkway? Horrible, right? It can take a long time, just a very small distance. I choose to take public transport into work, into the city every day, and it's an absolute pain. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but um, I, I, I feel well, I that. Pain. I yeah. So I, I think it's absolute adequate as it is, right? And to have additional houses uh, or residents, so although I would always welcome additional residents, will make the situation worse, right? So that's a no-brainer. Um, as a professor on transport, I had a look at, this, uh, at, the, at the transport study that uh, the developers have uh, commissioned, and the first sort of uh, thought that I had was, oh, it's very complex, a lot of assumptions in, in there that, that you can question. Um, and it has been written by a company that was also involved in, Bay in, in developing the Rangaroo. So that points to me uh, to, um, you know, to money being spent. And you, Rory, mentioned that you know the developers put marketing plans on, on their website and everything. So there's big money being spent already. And I think that is the answer to a question that was asked earlier. You now, why is it progressing? It's all about money, in my view. I don't, well, that might be wrong, you know, again, as a resident. Um, it's not wrong. But, um, it's not wrong. you know, it's, it's the CEO said it himself. So the CEO uh, of the Metropolitan Lens. Metropolitan Land Council. Land Council said it himself, as we hear. So it's about money, right? Um, uh, and uh, in terms of the transport assumptions, I mean, there's lots of things that we could discuss, but I've only a short amount of time. But uh, I mean, topography, you know, to assume active transport there, I don't think that is quite correct, what, what, what has been written there. And, um, and again, like so many things that are questionable. Um, uh, obviously, I'm not pitching here to do another one, which we would be happy to do, um, especially when there's big money being spent, <laughs> the receiving end. Um, no, but I think we would come to uh, very different outcomes. And uh, as I said as at the beginning of, of those two minutes, uh, I think the current infrastructure is not adequate and it will not be in place for when this is a development uh, is, 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 is finished um, and, and, and more, 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 more to this, um, obviously I'm, I'm not talking about you know, when, when the houses are in place, but during the construction phase, this is another issue, right? So all the construction traffic 
that road will become essentially one way sort of road, very dangerous. And, um, and so just that construction traffic alone should be reason enough to reject the proposal. Thank you. <laughs> Kristen, what are the broader implications of Lizard Rock being approved? What about the rest of the metropolitan rural area and deferred lands? Yeah, I think we've probably discussed this earlier in the panel, but essentially uh, there's a lot of land and private ownership in that area of sort of Belrose, Oxford Falls, and sort of even parts of Terry Hills, where at the moment our current zoning rules keep that as conservation zoning or as rural zoning, which controls the amount of development that can take place on it. When you have one landowner then that seeks what's referred to as a sort of spot rezoning of their, just their site, um, our concern as the Bushland Guardians is that you get a bit of a floodgates issue because all of the reasons that we restrict development for all those other places, you know, biodiversity, traffic, bushfire, all of those same constraints apply to all of the other land in that area. And that land is in performing an important role in terms of providing bush buffer to national parks, wildlife corridor for wildlife. So we're concerned about the sort of broader precedent that's created because if one landowner can create, seek a spot rezoning to rezone a very large biodiverse area with bushfire risk to R2, which as I said is the weakest basically form of residential zoning, everyone's going to sort of have that kind of I'll have what she's having kind of moment and and it becomes a broader implication um, you know you then have clearing for more roads in those areas clearing for the houses something that Rory didn't touch on but you know part of the way that this proposal justifies its level of risk for bushfire is having huge asset protection zones which are basically in some parts as 100 meters wide of clearing so that there's a break between bushland and houses and you'll have those massive apz's cleared throughout all of the private land through there so that we can backward engineer a starting point of housing being allowed there rather than using a common sense approach that if you've got to clear so much land to protect the housing, you shouldn't build it there in the first place. So, um, <laughs> um, so I think that this is, you know, as has been alluded to, the planning process in this state is um, I don't think it's intentionally designed to exhaust people, but that's how it operates. Um, you know, at every step you feel like you've got to put the jack in the box back in the box. You know, you have to keep writing submissions, keep signing petitions. You're not sure whether you've signed it or submitted it before, but you have to keep going. And then the, there's no institutional memory. It's like our planning department has dementia and so it forgets that it got any submissions about Lizard Rock back when we were talking about the DDP and said all the same bloody stuff about wishfire and precedence and we said it all then and now we've got to say it all again because otherwise, you know, they'll gleefully write an assessment report where we only had 200 submissions so clearly, you know, the community doesn't care anymore. Um, even though the community is just totally exhausted from having written, I think in the last DDP consultation there was about, I'm going to say about 1,500 submissions that the community wrote. So look, if there's one thing that me and Rachel are very good at, it's being annoying. And so <laughs> we've got a goal of 3,000 submissions and we're going to keep being annoying to the department. Um, and maybe it won't work, but at least we'll have annoyed them. <laughs> Thank you so much. We've gone through our questions. We are going to have an open Q&A. So if you do have any questions, please come down the front and queue up here because um, you'll be coming onto this microphone and you can ask who you want. Um, I would like to... Um, I know Rory mentioned Matt Cross, who can't be here because he had an emergency. Um, however, he has done a video. Um, so the video is online and I've put it on Facebook today. Um, so please watch that video. He said, did an apology to the community online and we're very grateful for that. I'd also like to say that our group is for also 
We do run affordable housing forums and we're very much for affordable housing and more housing for families on the northern beaches. I wouldn't call us NIMBYs, we're totally against that. We would like to see a solution, but we also want an equitable outcome for the Land Council. We want to see that this land is bought, hopefully, by state government and there's a land swap, and that they can build where it would be more suitable and that no bush will be destroyed. So I want to make that very clear, that we want to see them have a good outcome and we want to work with them, and that's why we're empowering Michael and Rory and our council to do the work on that, and we hope to see a good solution and that, you know, we can come up with a solution together. Um, I know wildlife questions haven't been asked tonight, so before we go to open questions with the panel, I'd just like to get Wendy up because I am aware that some people ask me about wildlife. Wendy's worked at Taronga Zoo for 30 years. She's a native ma mammal specialist, and um, I know two people have got questions to ask us. So Wendy, if you can come up to the microphone, and I will take the microphone to those two people, if you can raise your hand, who want to ask those questions. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Um, just while we're waiting, so I actually am from the Hunter Valley, um, but I did grow up in the area, so I'm definitely not a NIMBY. Um, but I, as I said, grew up in the area, and it's this sandstone country is in my bones. It's just so so precious, and I'm very very passionate about. Is, this be, is that better? Okay, um, and I'm also probably not the most qualified person to uh, speak on this issue. But as the mayor said, um, I was tapped on the shoulder. I was here. I'm so passionate about this, so I've put my hand up. So forgive me if I. Uh, can't address absolutely every issue. I will do my best. And we have a question. Um, my question is, how would this affect the local wildlife population in the area? Well, um, it will be, it would be absolutely devastating. Um, so there are, I've taken this from the ecologist report that I've had a quick look through, um, and also Bionet and iNaturalist records. There are about 46 threatened species um, that would be impacted in different, different ways. Uh, there are seven threatened species that are recorded or known to actually live on site. Um, so they include the Eastern Pygmy Possum, um, the Rosenberg's Goanna, what else is there? Uh, glossy black cockatoos, powerful owls, um, large eared pied bat, there's quite a few bat species. Um, I might pause and just uh, recognise the eastern pygmy possums. I know there are some other wildlife people in the room. Has anyone actually seen an eastern pygmy possum before? Aren't they? They are just the most amazing little creatures. And I think a great flagship species for lizard rock um, because they're so tiny and nocturnal and they can live right on our doorstep and we don't even realise that they're there but they are in themselves just so incredibly precious. If you disturb them in their nest box and they're in torpor, they will roll out in a little ball into your hands, a little roly-poly ball with their cat tails all curled up um, and with their little ears over their eyes. They are just the most magic creatures. But they are also, of course, really important. All, all species have an ecosystem service um, and they are incredibly important as pollinators, uh, among other things. Um, so there are also 15 threatened species that are known nearby um, that would um, use um, the land for sure and another 24 that potentially benefit or could be benefiting uh, from this land. Uh, but the others that uh, tend not to be captured in these <coughs> reports and also in our laws and also in our policies are the local species that we take for granted the possums and the skinks and the honey eaters and the scrub wrens um, and all of those species that, as I said, we just completely take for granted, but they are disappearing. So having grown up in the area where possums used to gallop across your roof and people would complain, where I so am still visiting my parents from time to time, the rooftops are now silent. There are no possums in our area and that's just declining throughout the area. These patches of bushland are such important reservoirs uh, for these more common species that are basically keeping the local ecosystems healthy and functioning. Now, keeping 
our, um, our land alive. And of course, we are part of the land. We do actually depend on it, which we forget. So the more common species, we need to stand up for those guys as well. And echidnas, yeah. Yep, um, wallabies, uh, yep, quolls, sugar glide. The, the, list, the list goes on. There are so many species that would, um, um, that would be impacted severely by this. And um, we have another question. Yeah. Um, thank you uh, for allowing us to ask questions. Um, my question is um, in regard to all of the animals that you just mentioned. Um, we're talking about their homes, their habitats, that's what they know. What are, where are all of these animals going to go initially if this development goes ahead? And what's going to happen to them? That, that's a great question. Um, yeah, they basically, well, they will die. I mean, um, ecosystems have a, a carrying capacity and that tends, nature tends to optimise um, the way it works. So if, um, if there's habitat for a particular species, it will pretty much be filled. And so having another animal that's displaced. Um, I mean, I know with wildlife care, you can with individuals sometimes have success um, in a sort of a drip feed situation, but a mass scale like this, they will die basically. Um, and that is the shocking part. And the hard part about that, that is, as I said, because our native animals are cryptic, this happens without us seeing. So we don't notice that they're there. We don't notice when they're gone and we don't notice their deaths. So there is a very important welfare consideration here as well that is never acknowledged, is the death of all of these animals. And another question. Hi, that's Kathy Brennan. I can answer all that because I rescue for wires. And really, when you knock down all the trees like that, you actually kill most of them. That's the first thing, because they can't get away. And the ones that are on the surround, they go into people's roofs, they're killed by the other wildlife because they're territorial. It'd be like your neighbour copping into your house and deciding they want to live there and you wouldn't be terribly pleased about it. So I pick up lots of things, you know, and cats, cats and all, you know, are, are destroyers as well. But people who cut down their trees, the, the animals have got to go somewhere and they go into people's roofs and then everyone gets upset about them. And they're really, you know, you, we're taking their homes, so... You know, we need somewhere for them to go. And it's really, it's so easy to put up um, hose, houses for the, for the uh, possums, um, ringtails and brush tails, There's, that's no problem. But when you destroy big areas like this, you just really, you're just signing all their death warrants and, and all the surrounds as well because they just get killed as well. It's very depressing. Any other wildlife questions before we ask the panel? Hi, I'm Fiona and I live near Worrywood Wetlands. Um, every Saturday morning I'm just heartbroken as yet another huge tree comes down and it's legal. So the 1050 laws are devastating. Once you put one house in, down come anything within 10 metres, any tree and any shrub 50 metres. And so once these houses go in, it will never, literally, it will never be the same because the law says you can take out all of that, whether you don't like the leaves, whatever it is. You like prefer a lawn, you know, and, and the wildlife just don't get a chance. So it will be ongoing destruction. It won't be just the original destruction. It'll be ongoing forever till there's nothing left and it's just concrete and houses. I think there are a lot of deficiencies in our environmental law and policies, but I think this is why the community, uh, like community gatherings like this, are just so critically important and that we mustn't um, lose our energy and lose our hope. We have to keep the submissions coming and we have to keep um, people, people power uh, to try and make some of these changes. Martin Anderson. Um, the other thing that hasn't really been touched here is fragmentation of habitat. So looking at the map, it's a, it's a big sort of east-west development. And so you're going to get habitat south of that that is no longer connected. What's the effect there in terms of size of habitat for various species? Are we going to reach uh, critical sizes where things like wallabies or echidnas won't have enough habitat? 
Uh, absolutely, and I know it's a, an, ed an educated audience here. Um, but urban edge effects um, impact on the smaller fragments, and the uh, I know that this development makes sort of a token um, offering of some areas that will be conserved, but those smaller patches will be almost entirely impacted by urban edge effects, which will then degrade um, those, plus the fragmentation of the landscape, of course. So um, biodiversity needs to be looked at at a landscape scale as well as at species scale. So that um, the fragmentation makes it very difficult uh, for fauna and other species to survive. The other thing that um, I think maybe in ecology is starting to be recognised more and more is that the health of our national parks can only be as good as the landscape that they sit in. So our very national parks depend on the surrounding landscape. For example, consider a white-headed pigeon that might take a fruit um, in Karinga National Park, fly out of the national park to search for more food. Where it does its dropping is going to be critical. Will it, will it do its dropping and produce seed on in, um, infertile, hostile urban land, or will it do its dropping on perhaps a bushland remnant and continue that biodiversity cycle? Um, so, I mean, just th these patches of bushland are so incredibly important. And I think we are really at that important tipping point. Will our children have know what a dawn chorus is? Will they be able to turn over a leaf and see a different type of insect? We're at that tipping point right now. This fight is just so incredibly important for thank our wildlife and for everyone, future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Wendy. Um, we've got 20 minutes, guys, to do a quick two minute each response to your questions. If you can come up and queue here, um, I will remember you at the back and come to you. If you can come up, I'm going to give these guys the microphone. So if you can tell me who you'd like to address the question to, that would be fantastic. Oh, good evening, um, councillors. Go right up to yep. the mic, sorry. Good evening, councillors. Uh, good to see a lot of people here this evening. Uh, ben Rock, I'm a local town planner. I've worked in government, I've worked in private development. I don't work with developers in a cheap suit anymore. Um, I try and stay neutral and look for a reasonable outcome. What I'd like to point out is a few holes in this submission um, from the applicant. There's no biodiversity certification. There's tens of thousands of houses being built in Western Sydney. They're all subject to what's called biodiversity certification where the land has been approved for clearing subject to DA approval. No such certification exists here, and it probably never will. Secondly, there's no voluntary planning agreement. That's a legal mechanism, a contract between the developer and the government. It ensures that funds go towards funding local infrastructure, whether that's improvements to Morgan Road and traffic lights, which are needed, whether it's to fund local firefighting services, which will be critical, we know, whether it's for funding for external bodies who will benefit from this. Where is the money going? There's all this talks about benefiting the local community and the, the wider community, but do we know where the money's going to go? There is no contract, there's no voluntary plan agreement to confirm that that will actually happen. Look at Defence Housing um, Australia. They've done over 200 blocks of land on Schofield's aerodrome. I was personally involved in that. They followed um, all due course mechanisms to get their rezoning through. No special favours, it was all done in the, in the name of providing good housing. Why can't we have 450 houses, whether it's on the Northern Beaches and the appropriate land on Warringah Road, or the government is able to provide land which is able to be zoned for housing with no constraints. This land we know is highly constrained and just not suitable for this sort of housing. There's no holistic assessment to actually look at the final outcome of housing, it's simply subdivision. The subdivision plan is very basic. I actually was involved in this five years ago before I walked away, so I can't do this. Um, as I mentioned, it, there's no, and there's no environmental impact assessment. So that would need to look at full assessment of stormwater onto Narrabeen Lake. How much clearing is involved, as you mentioned before, Kristen, um, 100 metre asset protection zones. How much clearing, how many hectares involved beyond the housing? That's a big question which hasn't been answered so far. The Rural Fire Service some years ago blocked the rezoning of Rawson Avenue. That was for 127 lots. And I actually raised submissions and said this is possible, subject to providing APZs and biodiversity land to protect the national park below. I haven't seen a submission like that yet, but I'm surprised that Rural Fire Service haven't been more vocal in opposing this. I don't know why, Rory, but I'd like to know what the 
commissioner and deputy commissioner have to say. I know a lot of it's local around here. Have they been silenced? Have they still been given a voice? I hope they have been. No pun intended. Um, and last but not least, Michael, we, we both know you too quite well. Good song, Where Streets Have No Name. Well, it should be Where Streets Have No Shame because that's what's going to happen if this thing goes ahead. So, look, thanks everybody for coming along tonight. It's And I do encourage you all to make a written submission, as Kristen said, because as a planner, I know we walk away with dementia thinking, oh, well, people have forgotten about it. Let's not forget what's going to happen here and make your submissions, please. Keep them clean, keep them simple, and keep them professional. Don't get emotive, just state what you know. Thank you. I think, I think we found another Bushland Guardian to join us. Who <laughs> would you like to address your question to? Um, anyone on the panel. Um, I'm from outside of the area, from Kurengai. Um This affects everybody. Um, I hear tonight that um, we should make submissions. Uh, what I want to know is what is um, our further call to action other than making submissions? What can we do further than making a submission? I'm sure everyone's got some thoughts on this, but yeah, at the moment it's writing submissions. Um, so, um, other than that, I mean, the Bushland Guardians, we've been running a campaign for the last almost year. So, if you're not on our mailing list, please go on the website. It's written on the banner over there. Um, we've got activities that pop up and we'll be thinking next, at every stage, we'll be thinking, what more can we do? whether it's concerts, whether it's annoying Michael Regan, whether it's annoying a minister, um, he's, he's happy to be annoyed. Um, you know, we, it will, we love your ideas as well, you know. I mean, we, as Bushland Guardians, each of us have our own background and ideas, you know. We've been at the markets talking to the community to raise community awareness, which is sort of its own battle. But, you know, we'd love to hear your ideas because... Um, you know, as Sue said, part of it is a legal battle, and I think probably for most in the community, I'm going to guess you don't have a few hundred grand to go um, have fun in the land and environment court for a while. Um, there are big pockets that would need to think about whether that's an option, but as community members, you can do things like on our website, we've got template letters to write to all the relevant ministers. Um, something we haven't touched on, for example, is that this proposal requires privatisation of a number of paper roads within the area, as well as um, the slip road that Rory referred to is actually on council's land, so it's really good of them that their whole bushfire risk mitigation basically requires either to council to gift them the land or for them to get the RMS to acquire it office. So um, writing to the Crown um, Lands Minister about that, writing to the RFS minister about the bushfire risk and his duty of care to volunteers and future residents there that he just can't assign to the minister for planning. Um, writing to the environment minister, both state and federal. As Wendy mentioned, we have threatened species there, but we have threatened species that are protected both at a state government level, but also we have federally protected species that are present at Lizard Rock. Um, we did write to Nipil the second. Her response from the department was a little um, lukewarm, shall we say. But I'm sure that if all 200 people in this room wrote her a letter, um, it starts to get the message across that it's not just kind of one random group of greenies. It's actually a huge community movement that wants to keep the bush, you know, how it is. So, but you know. We're not the experts, this is a community movement. If you've got ideas, hit us up, go on our website, we've got an email address, get in contact with us because um, we can only win by fighting this together. So you're saying if you get to, say, 15,000, then they're going to reject it? No, it doesn't matter. It could be a million, it could be 30, it could be 3 billion. Um, to, to answer the question about, I guess the question is, what can we do? There are three observations I'd make. The, the first observation I'd make is, um, and suggestion is, make your submissions because it then gives Michael and James and Matt 
and myself actual basis to say the community don't want it. It actually gives us a reason. Whereas if we don't have the submissions, it just looks like we're out in a frolic um, just saying we don't want it for, for unspecified reasons. That's the first thing. Um, the second thing is um, there are really a shed load of technical arguments here and really in-depth issues. Um, very few of us here are planning experts or environmental experts. Um, the planning experts aren't even, or are barely planning experts themselves. And so there's a lot in it. So when it comes to the legal arguments and the technical arguments, council is on the case, council's commissioning reports, as far as I know, council's gonna object. And if they need to, I dare say it may be council who are taking this to court. And so we don't need to worry about that. Um, the third thing is, is that ultimately, if this doesn't get rejected on technical grounds or on legal grounds or whatever it might be, um, the ultimate decision maker is the minister, is a political figure. So this becomes incredibly political. Now, as a can and, and I don't like to get political, but this is political. And so as a, as a candidate, as a liberal candidate, our position was at a political level, it would go through the process because it has to, and yes, it was allowed to start under the last government, which was a Liberal government. We, we don't walk away from that. But the commitment was, if there is a Liberal government in New South Wales, the political decision will be to say no, even if the panel says yes. We now have a Labor government. And so, as a Liberal, um, we have a minority Labor government. As a Liberal, it doesn't mean a lot if I say to the Labor government, and yes, I will give them hell, and yes, I'll do everything I can on behalf of my community to advocate against it. It doesn't mean a lot if I say to them, I'm going to withdraw my support from the Labor government because I'll say, well, you're, on the, you're, you're in the opposition anyway. We don't care if you withdraw our support. But um, Michael has the benefit of being on the crossbench as an independent. And if I was an independent on the crossbench who ran for parliament on the basis of this development going ahead or not going ahead, I would be saying to the government at that stage, if the panel approves it and if court proceedings are unsuccessful, I would be saying to the government, I'm withdrawing my support from you if you, as a politician, approve it. And so that would be my call to Michael at that time, not now, because it's going through a process, but that would be my call um, to anyone on the crossbench to be saying to the government, if you approve it, I'm withdrawing my support and I will not support this government under any circumstances for any reason. That's what I'll be doing. Yeah, that's okay. Don't be sorry. Um, all true. One question I'd like to know was, um, and I think Ben touched on it, will the RFS be notified? They will actually, they will do a submission, they do a formal submission, it goes through that process and I don't know when it becomes public, but it will become public. But uh, we were in the chamber of the petition, Kristen was there, the Bushland Guardians were there, Rory, James, myself, and the planning minister looked at the gallery and said, um, the Rural Fire Service has the power to, um, to kick this to touch, essentially, to, to kill this project. Rory, I'm going to put you in a little bit of an awkward position, and I don't, don't mean to, not, um, but how much can our local rural fire service volunteers activate to oppose this? They don't want to be put in danger. They don't want to, there's a process, they've got to let it go through hierarchy and all that sort of stuff. But are they able to mobilise locally and approach the minister themselves as, hey, I'm a local, I'm a fire, I'm a volunteer, you shouldn't be approving this. I mean, you're a local here and I know there's a couple in the room. Are you guys able to do something or create a way to do that and have some sort of power? Because I think you guys hold the key. Yeah. I, that's a really good point, as we're just like handballing it one to the other. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, no, no, look, and that's a really good question because um, I've had this conversation with our local RFS district office. And what I said to them was I said, are you... Um, going to be making a submission on this. Um, and they can't speak publicly because they work for the machine. And they said, no, we, we have no input, we have no say. It's all done out at Homebush. And so, um, which, to me, which, which to me is horrendous. And what I suggested to them was that they should be sending emails and their own submissions to head office so that there is a paper trail showing opposition from the local RFS district which will then be documents which will magically uh, be gibbered or FOI and become publicly available and be able to be used down the track. Because my suspicion, being the cynic that I am, 
is that the um, Homebush RFS will be being told will be told by the minister's office to let this through and, and to give it a favourable um, favourable pass. Uh, to, to your point about local RFS, that's a really good question, and, and I actually met with the Bushland Guardians um, early this year, and some of my suggestions related around uh, having the district office send those emails, the staff, but also local brigades writing into the district office and writing submissions as well. So whether that's the Belrose Brigade or whether it's the Ingleside of Terry Hills or whether it's the Davidson Brigade um, or, or whoever it might be, making those submissions saying, we don't support this proposal for reasons X, Y, and Z. I think that's important and, and they're entitled to do that. That there may be issues around whether they can use brigade letterhead or whatnot, but they can certainly say they're volunteers and so on and so on. So I think that's certainly possible. Um, but w And the other suggestion I gave was, if we can get our local RFS staff to send that correspondence, that would also be really helpful. But if the government is intent on getting this through and it gets past the technical and legal challenges, then it, it becomes political. Very quick, very, very quickly, because I wanted to say what I've been doing as an example. Obviously, do the submission, take this into work. Uh, so I've been talking to people in Transport New South, for New South Wales who are also involved in this. They're senior, they are against it. Um, and uh, I think most importantly, we should tell all our friends, especially those living south of the bridge, uh, because not many people know about this, and the more people know about it, the more submissions you get. There. And again, it comes back to the point that I made earlier. You know, if this gets through, it will set a precedent. And those developments will happen up and down the coast, so it affects a lot more people than just us. I think it's really important. That's why that's how we get more submissions. Thank you. And I would like to say that we have, as Bushland Guardians, approached the local fire brigade services, um, but nobody's wanted to get involved at the moment. So if you are in the room and you are involved with the local brigade, please reach out to us because we. We are looking for someone to talk to and someone to lead that for us in the community. Uh, yeah, just, um, you may have already touched on this in your answers on the panel, but could you explain how this development is inconsistent with local and regional planning strategies and is that something that can be worked into our submissions at a simple level? Um, whoever feels like answering that one. Yeah, I mean, the short answer is that council's doing a huge amount of strategic work to think about plan our future housing needs. And I went through line by line what is in the planning proposal. And basically, you know, there's a lot of, I have to say, half-truths in terms of its compliance with council's policies. So this proposal doesn't reflect council's big picture, all of Northern Beach's strategic planning work, okay? The, the council has been looking at the whole of the northern beaches to map out our conservation areas. It's been looking at all of the deferred lands to look at bushfire risk to try and basically um, stick all the data in and then out spit out a new consolidated LEP. This is this proposal is basically trying to sidestep that process because council's current line of thought is that if council was to rezone this to be um, part of that bigger whole of Northern Beaches LEP, we would make this site C3, which is the highest private land, highest form of environmental conservation zoning you can apply to privately owned land without basically promising to acquire it off them. Um, ideally, it would be even higher, but we don't have the money to acquire the site from them. So um, I think hopefully that answers this question is that this is a a process that has been created just for this landowner to help them sidestep where the strategic direction would otherwise go, which is that this would be kept as conservation land. Just to add, so where it's out of the process is that councils have to do, by law, uh, uh, the, st the strategic housing strategy, uh, the, the housing strategy, You've got to tell them where it's going to be built, how it's going to be built, and how you're going to meet the targets that they set and we agree to. So if we've agreed to 10,000 dwellings in our area across the next 20 years, where are they going to go and demonstrate how they can be built? If we've done that, we've gone through that, we've updated it, and so separately they've gone and said, well, here's another 450 dwellings you can have, which we're talking about tonight, Lizard Rock, which are outside all of that. Now, this was agreed to with government and council and the community, and this has just gone completely outside that process. So there's a statutory lawful steps we've followed, 
and they just went and blew it up last year. It, I think that's more of the technical side of it as opposed to, yeah. We are running out of time, guys, so I'm aware there's three people here and a lady here, and we might stop there. So if we can kind of keep the answers short, that would be great. Thanks. Hello, my name's Margaret Woods, and I'm from Friends of Narrabeen uh, Lagoon Catchment. And that group has been together for a very long time, protecting the catchment, um, disputing various DAs and proposals over many, many years. Um, we're very upset about this proposal. A lot of our um, committee are not able to be here tonight. Um, one is here, which is uh, Dr. Connie at the front here. Um, anyhow, we also got involved in the Ingleside um, debacle and there was a lot of information that came out of that that helped to reverse what was planned. So maybe we can learn from what has gone on before. There were traffic studies done about evacuation routes and that seemed to tip the RFS to our favour. Um, there were a lot of planners involved in the Eleanor area because it affected other suburbs and um, they were very upset about it as well. So a team got together. We had lots of posters up. So there was a lot of publicity. Um, we used our Facebook, so the Friends of Narrabeen Lagoon Catchment. If you need to post something, we're quite happy to help. We've also approached the minister asking what independence there is in this process and we can't see that there's anything independent about the process, but we're waiting for an answer. So there's those sort of questions that still remain. Um, I'm also involved in wildlife care, and um, I'm just really worried about what is going to disappear. Your children will miss out. You need to get your children to also do things at school and maybe send that in and get publicity. So that's just a thought because a lot of the people here are family. Um, you, each person here probably represents four people. So you know four people, so you can all do a submission from your house. You can also get your neighbours involved and each do a submission. We represent, I can't, I, I think, well, my Facebook is like 700 people, but the, the, our group has about a thousand uh, or more. Um, but when we put a submission in, that doesn't count as a thousand, that counts as one. So we all need to put in an individual submission, and if you've got kids, get them to do a submission as well. That's, that's it. I didn't really ask a question. It was more just to say that we're here and we're still working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody who wants to answer it. All right, so some years ago, uh, I live in Ralston Avenue, and I, I'm presuming that uh, Lizard Rock was Crown Land, the same as Ralston Avenue was Crown Land. So we went to Andrew Humpherson to say, you know, can we actually make it a sanctuary or something down the end of Ralston Avenue? And what he said to us was that if you want to do anything with Crown Land, it has to be gazetted. And as soon as it's gazetted, the Aboriginal Land Council land on it, and we have to give it to them. Why? It's Crown Land. The native title, or the, the, the relevant act, Land Rights Act. The, so the Land Rights Act basically allows um, land to be claimed. There, there are various um, reasons that the claim could be knocked back if it's been used, if it has a purpose, things like that. So on the northern beaches at the moment, there is 371 undetermined land claims. I asked the government where they were, they wouldn't tell me. I asked the government what land on the Northern Beach was owned by the Land Council, they wouldn't tell me. So um, th that act dictates when and where and how claims can be made and the basis on which they can be rejected. That's just a, oh, how right. it, yeah. I'll claim it.
into that debate about whether land, about land rights, we start from the position that Metro has the land and we have to operate from a position of thinking about this proposal like they're any other landowner and on a merits assessment of bushfire risk, planning issues, ecological issues, this proposal doesn't stack up. That being said, I do think that it's worth recognising that we have an Aboriginal population in the northern beaches of about 1,700 people, including descendants of the original Garigal clan. Um, there are only about five local residents who, who are members of Metropolitan Local Aboriginal Land Council, so I do think it probably bears some observation that our local community who are Aboriginal people are not well represented in that organisation, and that has consequences that they're views and thoughts are not heard in how Metro deals with its land holdings in the northern beaches, which is concerning to me because I think um, speaking... To Look, I, I, I don't want to encourage people hatred towards Metro, but I do think that there's a, a balanced conversation to be had that our local Aboriginal community are not being heard as part of, in a meaningful way, in terms of how the land is used and that's something that should concern us if if we care about our you know local aboriginal community that their voices have not been heard in the process of deciding how this land is used and they won't probably see any benefit from it either hi my name is jennifer brennan i grew up in oxford falls i went to oxford falls school from 1957 um, the um which is now the peace part the bush was my playground. My father used to take us to the, um, the carvings as a child and he taught us how precious and spiritual they were. Um, how can we balance economic development with environmental conservation, particularly housing needs, in areas like Lizard Rock when there are competing, um, competing interests like the um, like the plants that are the the plants and the the uh, carvings and animals. I don't know who I'm going to ask, and yeah. And also, I'd just like to say, um, in ninety in the nineteen sixties, um, down at Oxford Falls, um, Oxford Falls West, very where just where the uh, Optus uh, was, across the road was. Rio Tinto found um, blue metal and wanted to put a mine there. Oxford Falls didn't have many people in that time and they fought the government and they won. I think your question is how do we balance the need for housing and the environment and so on and so on. So I think the So the answer, the answer is strategic planning, which is you have a holistic approach where you take the community on a journey, you consult with community, you find out what they need, you find out um, what's actually needed, and then you, you prepare zonings and you educate people along the way, and that's called the local environment plan, which our council is currently doing. This cuts across that and undermines the whole process. So you need to go through a strategic planning process. That's what this process doesn't do. And so that's what needs to be gone through. And that's what the council is doing in terms of um, looking at the deferred lands, which this site is in, and actually zoning it appropriately for an appropriate level of development or conservation. Um, my name is Natalie Anderson. I live in Bantry Bay Road in French's Forest. So when Sue was talking before about it getting personal, it can't get any more personal than what's gone on in my street. So I don't know if anyone in this room has ever driven to the end of Bantry Bay Road and seen what happened when the um, land council sold that land. It got sold to a Chinese developer. Everything was smashed to the ground. It had asbestos dumped on there. And then during construction, the amount of um, building waste that my husband and I would witness every day going on our bushwalks where it was just dumped literally 
in the bushland across the road. So it's not just the impact on the land itself, it's the acid protection, hazard protection zones, um, but it's also what happens in that area from all the construction of the houses. I'm an architect. I do a lot of DAs through council. I have to jump through hoops. I cannot understand how that land was not zoned C3 and given the highest hoops to jump through because if I do a renovation on a house, I have to jump through hoops. But it's land that has already been developed. I'm not clear clearing virgin bush to do it and I just think that that development at the end of our street was the first precedent. If this precedent goes ahead I hate to think what would happen and I'm just wondering is there a way we can use that precedent to actually put in our submissions in a way that will be seen without obviously being too derogative but yeah, what happened there is exactly what's going to happen at Lizard Rock, and it is horrible. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if Council has anything they can assist with. The short answer is yes, just write politely. <laughs> write your example politely, but yes, you should put that as an example. And the reason it wasn't Zone C3, as Sue touched on, is that when we had the deferred... sorry. Minister Hazard, when he was the planning minister back in 2011, I think it was, he decided uh, from some, after some representations from some people in Belrose to defer a whole lot of our LEP submission, which was to be, I think it was E3 at the time, or it was E2, it was called back then, which is C3 now. Uh, and they said, no, because that takes away our development rights. And so Brad listened to that, and Brad said, well, we're going to defer that. And then council kept going down the path of trying to address it with Department of Planning. Department of Planning said no, 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 and then said yes, but it's going to cost you another couple of million dollars in reports, and we're not funding it. And we said, but it's fundamentally should be, and we did all sorts of site visits, and we said, yep, some of it is R2, most of it's E3, etc. So anyway, that's why. But yes, you should put that as an example. Because that's all combined development. Correct, and that's yeah. why 400 becomes 600, 700 very quickly. And that doesn't even count granny flats. Hi everyone, thank you so much everyone for uh, your amazing contributions. My question is only a minute, so give me a moment. <laughs> I'm just typing it furiously. The planning proposal at Lizard Rock Bell Rose proceeded to gateway determination two days before Christmas under the radar of other environmental coverage. Let's not virtue signal. It was under a Liberal government. The four ministers responsible were then Environment Minister James Griffin, Wendy Tuckerman, and former Planning Man Minister Anthony Roberts. If that former government did not allow it to proceed past ga gateway determination, none of us would be here today. The land would have already been kept as conservation land. I want to praise Northern Beaches Council, where 11 of 12 local councillors who rejected the proposal and commissioned an independent bushfire assessment report that showed the truth and the severity of the bushfire risk. They also worked before Christmas taking considerable resources for important documentation, declining acting as the planning partner. That was a huge effort and an amazing move from council. Thank you. I do want to ask why wasn't a land swap deal already negotiated? What was the outcome of the discussions with the ministers, lawyers, and importantly, a price for the ML ALC? Feels like with all this media attention, the price for a swap or, or compensation is just getting higher. And are you sure that this, um, oh sorry, do you need to pressure the Rural Fire Commissioner to advocate more effectively rather than just spouting environmental reasons to decline this proposal that are just not listened to under planning laws. This isn't political. I've seen all facets of the community come together over the last several years. And what I think we really need as a community is to get specific legal tactics where we can put a submission together that is actually going to be relevant, pointy and effective. 
So I ask the panel if there are any expert resources that you could share with everyone here today and the broader community about not just to have a passion submission, but how to actually be effective in making this stop. Thanks. Thanks, Joel. And I, look, I think, um, as Sue referenced and I referenced, Council will do all the legal work. Um, council will prepare the expert reports. If it needs to go to court, that'll be a matter for Council to determine. And I'm, I'm fairly confident that Council, without speaking to Council, that's something Council might do. But I, I do take issue, on the one hand you say it's not political, and then on the other hand you attempt to blame a political party. Um, there is simply no evidence that this government would not have done what the former government did. There's simply no evidence. But what we know, but what we know now, uh, without being able to change the past, is that the ultimate decision maker on this matter will be the Minister for Planning. End of story. Um, we, can, we can blame people for what's happened in the past, but what I'm saying is my party committed, and I'm a man of my word, that we would not allow this to proceed from a political decision. In this seat, that's the only reason that you decided not to, that you took, that you rolled that back, to win this seat. No, well, well we're, in, we're in Davidson now, um, and, 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 and the development isn't away, because, but let's, but let's be clear, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and the party and the then government heard what the community said, and on the basis of what the community said, they said, we are not going to allow it to proceed. I, I totally agree with you. I know that Minister Hazard and Minister Stokes were in the planning minister's office yelling at him about this. That is a fact. They did not support it. They were not happy when it happened. Now, it was approved. Minister, There's a Westminster system of government. There's a cabinet system of government. And ministers have certain leeway to make decisions. That's reality. The decision was made. They then The, the promise was made that if we were elected, the then minister, whoever that would be, would not allow it to proceed. That's where we are. That, that is, it, it, may, it will, may or may not be too late. We now have a new minister. That minister can make a decision or not a decision. That's where we are, okay? And, and so, so we're, we're there, we're there. There's a member for Wakehurst who, um, who is in, on the crossbench in a minority government. That member can withdraw support from that minority government if he chooses, but the reality is, this will either be successful on a technical and legal ground, um, as in it won't be approved on those bases, um, or it'll be a matter for the planning minister to make the decision. Now, I hope it's knocked back on the technical and legal grounds. If it's not, then we'll need to get the minister to knock it back. Um, on the question you asked about the uh, land swap, uh, I, I, there's smarter people in this room than me and you would not, I think, but all of us would agree you wouldn't do a land swap now because they, they're trying to maximise the value of their land. So if they get an approval for 400 developments, suddenly the land's worth 400 times more, so to speak. Um, so there was not, never an opportunity for a land swap. It is something that certainly Kristen and I, both on council and outside of council, have spoken about if worst case scenario happens, what is a plan B? Well, how does that work? Can we think creatively outside of the square? We'll let it go through the existing process now, as Rory's pointed out, and that's where we're at. We're at, so hopefully it'll get kicked to touch, as we said, and then we can start talking about. The other thing about what's happened previously about the, um, we did have a discussion, I was part of the discussion with the government at the time, and Stokes was the minister, and it was about making it an Aboriginal national park. But I understand we got to a certain agreement and level um, there was never any agreement on what the sum of money was to be because it would become sort of a lease agreement, if you like, but they never agreed to terms and the Metropolitan Land Council swapped in terms of the board became a new board. There was uh, there's other political issues at stake on the other side. So that's where it's at to answer the other part of your question. So while we're on the political issue, there's sympathetic people in Labor that we can Everyone? <laughs> I should say our local Labor, I'm not a Labor member, so I can speak objectively. Our local um, Labor branches are very supportive of our position of protecting the bush. Um, what they have told me is that it is being challenging to translate that into 
mobilising the state party's position. Um, I'm sure Michael's got more to add, but I do. So I, I just want to kind of say that there is there is diversity of opinions within the, the Labor Party. So um, I guess if you have friends who are local Labor branch members, you know, reach out to them and, and, and see what more they can do. I've been nagging all the ones that I know, but, um, you know. I actually think one or two is in the room, one of the candidates, but they were absolutely against it and they're doing it. And I know for a fact that those Labor candidates that ran in the previous campaign were working actively um, and talking to everyone they needed to talk to in their party to oppose it. Uh, and I think there's a statement made, and I handed this to the Premier and to the Minister only this week, um, prior to the election, which was a statement um, from the Minister saying he wouldn't support it if in government. So just a, here's a reminder of what you said before the election. Now you're the government, get your shit together. Um, yeah, I guess I'm the last speaker. Um, but I've read the Slope report um, in the planning proposal. And they themselves are saying that much of the land has high or medium slope risk um, assessment grade. And it says that uh, the houses would have to be a certain design. So I just wonder what... Um, legally if people buy that land are they going to be compensated if there's slope risk i mean just i don't know the complications of any of that but it just sounds really um risky um much of the land um reading the report is is quite complex there's boulder rolls and block rolls and all sorts of things you know overhangs over three five meters high um is that going to be released i mean it just seems to be so complex that's not simple land to build on. So I don't know who I direct that question to, but <laughs> uh, I just want to put it out there. <laughs> we don't want to get to that stage. That's, 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 this means that's been approved and then we're at the DA stage. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Engineering can solve any problem, it's just expensive. And when I was asked the question, what about affordable housing? No, this is affordable, simple as that. So, um, because of lots of these reasons like that. So the short answer is, we're preventing it from getting to the stage where we're going to worry about that. Guys, we're going to have to really wrap it up because it's getting late, but you wanted to ask a question quickly? Just one question. What about the Aboriginal cultural heritage in this area? Isn't this something as a global city that we are so privileged to have nowhere else in the world where we have such rich Aboriginal heritage? Can we use that argument? I'll just say one thing really quickly and then defer to the experts who should actually respond to this. But it's within their development that they're proposing is a cultural centre. And that is where they are trying to make sure that the areas that they know are very um, precious are going to be protected. The reality of it is though, as we know from Moon Rock and, and all the other wonderful carvings that there are around, that we don't know what's underneath because that's where a whole heap of Aboriginal artefacts are going to be. And that is to me one of the huge fears that once the deforestation starts and the clearing starts, how many more incredible carvings are probably going to be there, all special artefacts. And now I'm going to hand over to the actual experts. That's just my comment. I wouldn't go that far about the expert side of things, but we can help. Now, I'll tell you how Dennis and I have been invited over by the land councils uh, as Aboriginal people to go to their meetings. So, they accept us as Aboriginal people, but when it comes to having our say about this uh, development, we're all of a sudden not Aboriginal people, and we're not recognised. We've tried to get on the Land Council, Neil, Neil got registered to get on the Land Council, um, and they said, oh no, you, you can't prove your Aboriginal, your Aboriginality, and it's in their best interest to not let us be on the Land Council, because we want it to stay bush. So we, Neil has tried. I actually put uh, one in about 25 years ago. 
and um, it just got lost in paperwork. But the bush, they were going to um, clear a rent. They were going to have an exclusion zone around that that site at the back of Lizard Rock. There's apparently some more site down in the bush. There's some across the road that I found about 10 years ago where all the mountain bike tracks were. Uh, pardon? And the, yeah, there's a handprint in the cave on uh, Ralston Avenue down the end. There's, there's stuff in caves down there. Um, but don't forget that Metro Land Council owns a lot more land than they're developing. So who knows what's going to happen eventually. They own right to the National Park, tons of it, uh, both sides of Morgan Road. Um, we, we, we would love to be on the Land Council and have voting rights, but, and that would probably stop it, but they won't let us on the Land Council. They, they're supposed to let us on the Land Council, but there's, they just have their own, their own, they don't get questioned, ever. So we tried and they just don't get questions. It's a, it's a case of um, w when it's convenient, we're Aboriginal. When it's not convenient, we're not to them. We're not Aboriginal. Do you want to say something, Dan? There is something you can do. Um, unfortunately, you probably need to talk to Rory and Michael. Um, <laughs> well, it's a very political thing and uh, Michael will probably end up on 2GB again with us. <laughs> um, Section 52 of the New South Wales Land Right Act gives the Land Council of the area complete control over cultural and heritage matters. So the, your local custodians do not get a say. So the only way that can be changed is if you talk to your politician and see if they can get an inquiry into it and get it, get it changed so that local custodians do get a say. That's the only way that that will change. But that's up to these guys and, and their fellow members to do that. We'll probably get uh, bad mouthed on all their sites now for being here tonight, like Neil got attacked. And hopefully my business won't suffer too much because I do cultural tours. Um, we'll see what happens. <laughs> but that's just the way it is. At it, but I haven't read the act, so I'll have to look at it. All right. oh, thank you. Um, Australia has finally signed up to the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, there's a whole lot of guidelines and articles ex essentially explaining what all those rights are. And what we just heard, I think, is actually quite interesting in that respect. Um, Article 25. It says Indigenous peoples have the right to maintain and strengthen their distinctive spiritual relationship with their traditionally owned or otherwise occupied lands, territories, etc., etc. Um, so there's, there's another three or four paragraphs through Article 26 and Article 27 that basically recognise the rights of Indigenous people to their traditional lands. And we have a land council here who doesn't have the traditional owners on board. And it seemed that what they're proposing actually breaches. Um, Indigenous rights under Article 25, 26 and 27 of the United Nations Declaration. Um, but it costs money to challenge people like that. We can't challenge them. I've, I'm just working for day to day for a living and it costs money to challenge everything. We're fighting a carry-on as well. Every day we're fighting up there. We're also fighting out at Dural. So, that's, this is only one that we're fighting. We're, every day up there, with uh, all my mob up at Central Coast are fighting them up there. I've got mob, uh, um, Darug mob that are fighting them out on the back of Dural and a big sand mine. So it's happening everywhere and it's just ongoing. But it costs money to fight these people. They got tons of money, we got none. It's the, the system favours dollars everywhere. So. Thank you everybody for coming. I know we've gone over time and I do apologise, but obviously it's so important to discuss these issues and well done for coming and turning out. I'd like to just thank our Manly Observer, Alex at the back there for coming and supporting us tonight. 
really appreciate Alex. He's behind the Manly Observer with Kim Smith. And, and also, again, to Nicole and Christine from the other groups, Manly um, Dam Group, Narrabeen Lagoon and Pitwater. And also, let's give a hand for our wonderful panel, Sue Hines, Rory Amon, Michael Regan, Professor and Christine Glenda. And final note, obviously the Bushland Guardians, we've got Connie, we've got Pam, we've got Sarah, we've got Kristen, and we've got Deb at the back room and Marion. Thank you so much. And last job, on the way out, please grab some submissions, take them for your friends, the team will give them to you. It closes November the 7th. We really, 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 I absolutely urge you to grab a whole lot of paper and take them to your neighbours. Go on to Michael's website, go on to um, EnviroLink website, and I'm sure Council's got something from Rory. Go on to their website, see what they're doing, and please, please fill out those submissions. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Safe trip home.